Inna alhamdulillah. Indeed, all praise belongs to Allah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruh. We praise him, we seek his help, and we seek his forgiveness. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا And we seek protection in Allah from the evil of our souls and our evil actions. مَنْ يَهْدِهِ اللَّهُ فَلَا مُضِلَّ لَهُ Whoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ and whoever Allah leaves, leaves to stray, there is none to guide. Wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika lah. And I bear witness that none deserves to be worshipped in truth except Allah without partner. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his, his slave, his worshipper, and his messenger. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. Or you who believe fulfill your duty to Allah as He deserves by doing that which He has commanded you to do and by staying away from that which He forbade you from doing by placing a barrier between yourself and His punishment. And do not die except as Muslims. Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaqu rabbakum alladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa wa attaqu allaha alladhi tasaalu wa attaqu allaha alladhi tasaaluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum raqiba O mankind Fulfill your duty to Allah by acting upon His commandments and staying away from His prohibitions and placing a barrier between yourself and His punishment. Who cre he who created you from a single soul, who from that soul He created His, his partner, and from them both Adam and Hawa, and from them both. He created and sent forth many men and women and fulfill your duty to Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and be dutiful to the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever a watcher over you. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha wa qulu kawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَذِيمًا O you who believe, fulfill your responsibility or your duties to Allah by doing that which you have been commanded to do by Him. And by staying away from His prohibitions and placing a barrier between yourself and His punishment. And say a word which is upright and true. In turn, He will... Forgive you, you, rectify your actions and forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has attained great success. Amma ba'd, as for that which follows, فَإِنَّ أَصْدَقَ الْحَدِيثِ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ Then indeed, the truest of all speech is the speech of Allah. وَخَيْرَ الْحَدِي Hadiyu Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the guidance of, and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sharra al-umuri muhdathatuha and the most evil of all matters are those newly invented into the religion of al-Islam. Wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a and every newly invented matter introduced into Islam is a despicable innovation. وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every despicable innovation is a form of misguidance. وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And every form of misguidance is in the hellfire. 
After these words, which is known as Khutbat al Haja, with its translation for my benefit and for the benefit of my brothers, I wanted to address mainly the newly practicing brothers and sisters, new Muslims, for I felt that in many of the brothers and their families and their children who attend uh, this conference and these conferences, the Salafi conferences, they benefit greatly from the lectures without a doubt. But it could be that they require something also closer to the grassroots or closer to like a basic level. So on that basis, I was looking for the words of the ulama in this regard, and I found that Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, who's asked about the, what is it, what is the, the obligatory knowledge? What is the knowledge that every person or every Muslim has to know about without fail? So this now is a general question that was, a po- that was posed to the Imam Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz rahimahullah, and it's covering the full spectrum of everybody, new Muslims, uh, what might be termed as advanced Muslims or those who have had more knowledge or been around for a longer time and had the chance to learn. And he was asked, is it the religious knowledge or is it worldly knowledge? What is, not, what is the obligatory knowledge? Is it the religious knowledge? Is it worldly knowledge? Could you, go, could you give us an answer to that? He was asked. So the Shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said there are two types of knowledge. Knowledge relating to the, the religion and knowledge relating to the worldly affairs. And what is an obligation upon every single Muslim or every, rather every single individual who is of age? The age where he is taken to account or where she is taken to account which basically means someone who is, has reached the age of puberty, which is 14 and a half in all cases, and some cases younger than that, if the signs of puberty appear earlier. And someone who, is, uh, who's, who has his sanity not, not insane. The obligation upon that person is to have Islamic knowledge. In terms of what Allah Ta'ala made obligatory upon them and what he forbade them from doing in general, that's the summary. But he says, the ulama use, he says that the ulama, they have a, a way of um, describing the type of knowledge that everyone must know. And they say it is that knowledge that nobody is excused from being ignorant about. In Arabic they say, ما لا يسع جهله. ما لا يسع جهله. The amount of knowledge that nobody is excused from being ignorant of. Which basically, then he says, which basically means knowing that which Allah has obligated upon you and knowing that which he has forbidden you from doing. So a person therefore, he says, he learns the meaning of La ilaha illallah. He knows, and this is the obligation upon us, my brothers, to think about when you have, when you declare upon your tongue La ilaha illallah, to recognize and have that belief in your heart that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who deserves to be worshipped so the declaration is upon your tongue after the belief is settled in your heart knowing that none of my acts of devotion or worship or servitude is to be directed to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not directed to a to stones or to trees or to idols or to angels or any anything else 
knowing that everything besides Allah that is being worshipped is worshipped in falsehood as Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ وَأَنَّمَا يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ هُوَ الْبَاطِلِ that is because everything that is worshipped besides him that everything that, that is because they should know ذَلِكَ that is that indeed Allah he is the truth and everything that is being worshipped besides him is falsehood is batil so a person therefore knows that with certainty he is truthful when he says la ilaha illallah he, so if he understands it and he is truthful about when he declares it he has certainty about what he is declaring So my brother, my sister, now that Allah Ta'ala guided you to recognize your responsibility to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by worshipping Him and spending your life in a way which is better than what you may have been doing in the past, you should know your responsibility to La ilaha illallah is that when you declare it, you declare it with, cert with knowledge and with certainty and with truth, with an intention to act upon everything that it necessitates. Rejecting everything that it opposes. Accepting everything that comes with it. Shaykh ibn Baz, he said, and a person should also know what is the meaning of bearing witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the messenger of Allah. And again he said to, to bear witness, to declare with certainty and to declare truthfully that he is, he was sent as a messenger, as a rasul, as a messenger by Allah. to mankind, to all of mankind, to all of jinn, and that he is the final prophet and messenger. He also necessitates to believe that everything he informed us is true. If he is a messenger from Allah, then whatever he tells us is true. And if he is a messenger of Allah, then obeying him becomes an obligation. If he is a messenger of Allah, then what he forbade us from doing we have to avoid. If he is a messenger of Allah, we have to only worship Allah in the way that he taught. And this is, the why, this is why you hear the meaning of Shahadat Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. They say, Ta'atuhu fi ma amr, obeying him in what he commanded, believing everything he informed us of. If he is a messenger of Allah, then for sure that's what, that's what comes with it. Shaykh Ibn Ba'ath says, you have to also know about what salah, what is salah, what is it? And this, my brothers and my sisters, I want you to also, I'm talking about now, now I'm addressing the brothers who have been around for a lot longer, maybe many years. Each and every one of us have family members that don't have the same exposure or that hasn't given them the same tawfiq to family members to learn about the deen of Allah. And he tested them with you being amongst them. And he also tested you by being amongst them. Did you fulfill your responsibility to, uh, to them? Did you res fulfill your responsibility to your family members? So these words that Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz rahimahullah gave, they're for you to carry to your family members that are not on your level. That need to know the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Those family members that need to know the meaning of Muhammadun Rasulullah. So you're seeking knowledge, my brothers, is not an academic gathering of information. You have to be able to convert it into action. And from the actions, from the conversion of your actions, from the conversion of one of your knowledge into actions, is to convey it. 
as you would know from Surah Al-Asr. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ So you learnt it, now convey it. And who is the, who has the most responsibility over you in terms of conveying your knowledge? If it's not your mother and your father, if it's not your brother and your sister, if it's not your aunt and your uncle, who is it that's more deserving of that which Allah Ta'ala allowed you to learn? So what is salah? Sheikh Ibn Basi goes through now the, 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 quite briefly, he goes through the pillars of salah. What is salah? Uh, the, the pillars of Islam. What is salah? What is zakah? What is fasting Ramadan? What is hajj? So first and foremost, now if I, if I ask you right now to imagine yourself sitting amongst your family members and, uh, you know, and, and they're like, they say to you, tell us about, tell us about it something tell us about islam tell us tell me about something that you learn and, you know you go to these lessons so regularly we keep seeing you going and coming with books and you know, what are you learning ask yourself what am i going to say ask yourself what will i say right now put that question in your mind and say to yourself if i'm sitting in front of my aunt or my uncle and they ask me this question what will I say? Now, if, if you don't have an answer right now in your mind, that's problematic. That's problematic. And it could be more than one reason why you don't have a ready answer. And I, I expect that most of us, most of you, have a ready answer. But maybe you have not thought about the responsibility to your family members. Maybe you're just trying to save yourself from the fire as we all are and have to be. And I'm just trying to save myself right now. And I'm going to these circles because that's a good environment. I'm going with these brothers because they encourage me. But when I come into my house, I go to my room and I'm just listening to talks and reading books and browsing beneficial websites, not thinking about my responsibility to my family members and not thinking about how they are viewing me. How, are your fam how is your family v viewing you? How are your parents? Your, maybe your children if they're grown up. Maybe your brothers and sisters. How are they viewing you? They view you in a very, without you realizing it, they view you in, 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 a, uh, in, in terms of a like, very respectful way. Because you're doing something which is res respectful, particularly if you're showing and emanating good manners. But then are you fulfilling your responsibility towards them? What is Salah? Sheikh Ibn Bar says, this is the obligation that you have to know about. So you have to be able to learn, first and foremost, yourself, everything about Salah. Everything that surrounds Salah. Like, you know, like when the scholars of Islam speak about Salah, they say, well, you have to know, you have to know when Salah begins. You can't pray before the time. You have to know that you have to pray towards the Qibla. Then you have to ascertain what the Qibla is. And you have to explain that sometimes to, to, to people. And if you don't explain that to people, people may grow old thinking that the Qibla is something else. And there's an interesting personal incident that, I'm, that I experienced in my life where someone moved from Pakistan to the UK in the 80s or the 70s. And they moved to the UK when they were in a very old age. He was a grandparent. And they came to the UK in, the, in their old age. Now in Pakistan, Pakistan is east of Saudi Arabia. So in Pakistan, everyone's praying towards the west because that's where Saudi Arabia is. And the sun sets, obviously, in the west. So they use the sun setting as a sign that where the Qibla is, generally speaking, in Pakistan because that's their east and Saudi's west. So when this elderly lady, rahimahullah, came to the UK, and her family was saying, this is the way we pray. She was looking out the window. She said, no, show me the sun. And she would see the sun. She says, no, you, you guys are trying to lead me astray. The Qibla is this way. That's the sun. The sun is setting over there. And she stayed in the UK for 10 years praying in that direction. In the, to the west. And that is the danger of thinking, oh, 
these are obvious things and everyone knows about them. No, this is knowledge. And knowledge comes and removes ignorance. It's not a guessing game. It's not a guess. And if you, the moment, and the shaitan wants you to think that it's a guess and it's oh, so easy. Uh, and Sheikh Muhammad al Banna, rahimahullah, when we used to sit with him with Sheikh Abdulillah al Hamami in the early 2000s, rahimahullah ta'ala, Sheikh Muhammad, he would, he would, to be honest, this is my personal sentiment, he would shock me so much that he would speak about the basics of Islam and that, like he was talking about them for the very first time. He would talk to people about the basics of Islam, the basics of Tawheed and the basics of Salah and the basics of Wudu. Like it was the first time he'd ever spoken about it he was with so much excitement and so much love and so much passion. And I said to myself, looking at him after, I think it was like the third consecutive day, somebody had asked him a question and he spoke about the same matter that I'd heard from him yesterday. And I asked myself, would I be able to talk about this same topic three days in a row with the same passion? I began to question myself. And it's sitting with these people that you learn so many things. That's why they say you learn from the manners of the ulama. You learn from their, their sumpt before their knowledge. You will learn about how they carry themselves and how they deal with situations before you learn the actual things that they are teaching. So Sheikh Ibn Bazi says, these are the obligations that you have to know about. You have to teach your family members. You have to learn by yourself also. What is salah? What obligates salah? What breaks it? What, what negates salah? And when is it permissible not to pray towards the Qibla, for example? What are the other conditions? Okay, it's not permissible to pray other than that. But there could be a person in a situation. We hope that that lady that was praying in the wrong direction for 10 years, maybe she's forgiven and maybe her prayer was accepted. Maybe she's taken to account for her not seeking knowledge, but, but forgiven for her error. Allah knows best. We ask Allah for her mercy. But you have to know. And often the knowledge that we acquire, you don't get a chance to actually test it and test its veracity until you're put in a situation of compromise. You're at the airport, you have to go on the plane, and Salat al Dhuhr hasn't started. Salat al Dhuhr, for, let's say, has started. But you haven't got time to pray. Now, I'm not a Musafir because the airport is still in the city. Should be praying for Raqqa, should be praying standing facing the Qibla. But there's no time, and they're saying it's the last call, and they're saying you have to get on the plane. What do I do? Then you're going to say to yourself, oh yeah, I remember we covered this in a lesson. It's, these are the, the friction points in your life that you will get. That's when the implementation comes in. And you have to ask yourself, you know, how am I dealing with those situations? Am I prepared? So my newly practicing brother, my newly practicing sister, learn and know the importance of removing ignorance from yourself. And don't become overwhelmed with knowledge because knowledge comes in small amounts. It comes subtly and it comes over a long, a long distance. As I often say to my brothers, plan for the long journey ahead of you. Don't try to amass things in one summer. I'll do a two month crash course, for example, on Islam and then I'll be fine. No. You're in it for life. Learning, seeking knowledge, you're in it for life. And every single one of us is at one particular level in their lives, one particular level of Islamic knowledge. And you have to keep increasing upon that. But as we've heard throughout the weekend by our honorable mashayikh, Jazahumullahu khairan. May Allah Ta'ala bless them and raise their rank and increase them upon khair. You should learn things that you, that you can implement easily. Learn that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when the Mu'addin gives the Adhan, say as the Mu'addin says, 
and then ask Allah to grant me al wasila which is Al-Maqam Al-Mahmood, which is a station not befitting for anyone except me, O Kamaqala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you will be granted my intercession, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Make your religion practical, my brothers and my sisters. Learn about Salah, Shaykh al says, and Zakah. What is Zakah? Often you get questions, what is Zakah? You quite simply, is one fortieth of your wealth that is above a certain level that stayed with you for, for one year. But the year we're talking about is the Hijri year. It's less than the, the, the January to December year, the solar year. It's 10 days shorter. What is Hajj? What is Ramadan? What is fasting in Ramadan? What breaks your fast? Learn about the, 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 the virtues of Hajj, the huge rewards Allah Ta'ala has prepared for those people who perform Hajj. That person who returns from Hajj, having had it accepted without having transgressed therein, argued and sinned, he returns like the day his mother gave him birth. Learn about those things so it encourages you to long, to want to go for Hajj when you have the opportunity. And that it becomes an obligation upon you when you have the ability to do so. And it's only once in a lifetime. Shaykh ibn Baz says, learn also of those things that Allah made haram upon you. And this is the, this saying of Shaykh ibn Baz, learn about the things that Allah has made haram upon you. This is the way of the Sahaba. That Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, anhu, the companion, he said that the people used to ask Prophet sallallahu about good things, to, to learn about good things. I used to ask him about evil things, fearing that I may have to face them one day, and what to do like in that situation. Shaykh ibn Bas says, learn about the things that Allah made haram upon you. Know what constitutes a zina, he says. Learn about a zina, what is it? Fornication, what does it mean? Learn about a riba, interest, usury. What is it? Learn about al muskir. What are the what what are what amounts to intoxication? What is it? You have to know enough to to, to, to so that you're able to avoid it. The Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in the Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. Inna Allah kataba al ibn Adam hadhu min al zina. Adrakahu dhalika la mahala. Allah Ta'ala has written, pre, has decreed a portion, an amount of fornication for every son of Adam, every child of, every son and daughter of Adam. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the fornication of the eye is looking. And the fornication of the tongue is speaking. And the fornication, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the, and the, and the, the, the soul or the, the wishes and desires. And the private parts testifies to that being true or false, testifies in its favor or against it. And as the scholars of Islam, they explain that this means these are the, 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 the all of the roads to zina, looking at that which is haram, speaking in words that can lead you to fornication, looking at things that can lead you to fornication, and then converting that into action. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Whoever guarantees for me." That which is between the, two, the, the, the jaw bones and between the thighs, I will guarantee for them paradise. The tongue and the private parts. A person strives to protect himself from that. And Allah Ta'ala gave us solutions and protect, to, to protect us from the zina 
that he has already written that we will fall into. When he said in Surah An-Nur, Say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and protect their private parts or protect their chastity. That is purer for them. Allah is fully aware of that which they do. Allah commands us to lower our gaze. Saying that this is the way that you will protect your private parts. And then he told us that this is purer for them. And then he said, he is khabir. He is well acquainted with what we actually do. He knows that some of us are not lowering our gaze. He, is, he reminded us of his name, Al-Khabir. With a kha. That He has... Subtle knowledge, every level of knowledge about us. He is more informed of us than we are of ourselves. He is more knowledgeable of us than we are of ourselves. And then he, he subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُدْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ And say to the believing women, lower your gaze and protect your private parts. So the command is two-way. And this is a very important reminder, my newly practicing brother, my newly practicing sister. <clears throat> because one of the tricks of shaitan that he will play against you, and he, plays, and he played against many, is that when he watched you leave those evil environments that you may have previously been in, and he watched you being saved by the mercy of Allah Ta'ala to, to enter the circles of khair and goodness and masajid and conferences and good company. He, talking about shaitan, he took your focus away from, he took your focus from uh, hating people of sins to loving people of khair that the practicing brothers of the believing brothers, they start focusing on believing sisters. And no longer are they interested in those fasiqat, those trans, the, the, the transgressive, sinful women, lewd women. By the women, they covered, they're interested in women who are covered and who are modest and shy. But then they're not lowering the gaze. And the sisters likewise, they, they begin to hate the sinners. They begin to hate those personalities and so on and so forth. And they begin to have a, a like, likening to, to the believers and to the believing men. But then they're not lowering their gaze. And Allah Ta'ala's command to lower the gaze is to who? Is to Al-Mu'mineen and to Al-Mu'minat. Go to this ayah, these two ayats in, in, in Surah Al-Nur. Read the tafsir, my brothers and my sisters. You'll be interested to see how Allah Ta'ala, after saying about the believing women, lower your gaze and protect your private parts, then he says, and they should not unveil themselves. They should cover themselves. This is the, the ayah which mentions the hijab. And they should only uncover them the, 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 what naturally appears in front of their husbands and their fathers and then Allah Ta'ala mentions the male relatives that they're allowed to remove their hijabs in front of but he says at the end of this ayah Allah Ta'ala said at the end of this ayah wa tubu ilallahi jami'an ayyuhal mu'minun and repent to Allah altogether all of you believers la'allakum tuflihun so that you may be successful Ibn Taymi rahimahullah he says notice how Allah Ta'ala mentioned a tawbah, repenting to Allah after commanding the believing men and the believing women to lower their gaze and to protect, protect their chastity because he knows that 
every single one of them has had an aspect of zina written against them that they will definitely fall into something of looking at that which is haram so he commanded them immediately to hasten to tawbah and this is where a person balances and asks Allah for forgiveness knowing that he is the all forgiving because the Prophet sallallahu said that Allah Ta'ala said Ya ibadi innakum tukhti'una bil layli wal nahar wa ana aghfiru al-dhunuba jami'an fastaghfiruni aghfir lakum O oh my servants you sin day and night and I forgive all sins so seek my forgiveness and I will forgive you and Shaykh Ibn Ba says do whatever you can to learn about this and do whatever you can to stay away from those haram things and fear Allah as much as you can as Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran there's a lot more to say but the time is short and it's sufficient as a reminder for myself and for my brothers and sisters